thank you uh, uh, for Persistent Systems for uh, sponsoring uh, this. Thank you for our uh, other sponsors. Thank you for our uh, contributing members. And actually, I would like to take this opportunity because as I get older, I find it all too easy to forget about things. So I'd like to just uh, take this moment to thank uh, Diane and Rudy for their leadership and uh, make this happen today. So thank you. There was no guarantee I was going to remember that beyond that point. Thank you. Uh, so it's really a, a pleasure to see you all, and there's so much to talk about. Uh, I honestly don't know exactly where to start. And in fact, when I saw uh, this presentation or this teaser uh, by Persistent Systems, it actually made me feel uh, very positive about what we're achieving by having the, uh, these additional public APIs on top of the I2B2 stack. I think we're ex enabling exactly what we've wanted all along to happen. And indeed, uh, having a right back API has not been technically that difficult. Politically, it's been very challenging. And so, just so people know what I'm talking about, I2B2 started in 2006 with an idea that I concocted with some of the people in this room, which today seems almost so obvious that it's almost passe which is that we can use uh, data coming out during the process of healthcare and use it productively to drive both discovery uh, research and quality uh, improvement and safety uh, research. And that's been an incredibly successful um, enterprise, uh, both academically and commercially with several companies which have spun off of technology, some of which are in this room, some of which have just uh, uh, vanished with the uh, flipping of their uh, value into larger companies. But the important point to recognize is that in this realm, we've always read the data out of the system and almost uh, without exception, we don't write data back in. We do load data in through uh, ETL processes from the healthcare system with the various IT staff support, but very few applications write back to the underlying database transactionally because it's not viewed as a transactional system, even though it could be, it's viewed as a analytic platform. And so I'm very curious uh, of the uh, business cases that Persistent Systems has around it because again, as much as there is a, um, a obvious reason to want to write back, um, it's we've created walled gardens that say the data comes from a transactional system and that's the truth and we don't want to add to it. And I think what we're seeing now is the beginnings of change. At the same time, there's a lot to, to report in that read-only world. So for example, you'll hear uh, today and tomorrow about the picture API. This is a modern uh, authenticated uh, API that allows you to go against I2B2 instances. Ah, there you are, Paul. Uh, Paul Abic over there. Um, to allow you to go against I2B2 uh, instances and issue query in standard uh, open API uh, web style to ask combinations of clinical and genomic data. And that's so easy to say, but it's really always observed in the breach. What do I mean by that? There's a very rich, and I mean that both culturally and technically, a uh, rich community that focuses around the access to genomic data. And that's because it's a great new frontier uh, that we've only begun to uh, explore looking at all genomic data and looking at uh, finding the right variant, finding the right um, structural rearrangement, and trying to understand how those variants uh, vary across populations. And if you go around this country and internationally, there are many productive business plans and academic efforts 
about hosting and analyzing genomic data using those variants. But when it comes to the clinical part of it, the phenotypic part of it, things become much more amateurish. So if you look at a GWAS or even a FIWAS, so GWAS is case control study where you're looking at genomic characteristics across a, a uh, categorical phenotypic variable or FIWAS where you're looking across hundreds or if not thousands of phenotypic variables, it's still a very impoverished data set from the point of view of um, clinical data. And it, this became uh, very obvious to me when I was witnessing um, Paul Aviak interacting with this very interesting and very productive effort that's led by the National Heart Lung Blood Institute called Data Stage. So Data Stage is this effort that's led, led by Gary Gibbons, the head of the National Heart Lung Blood Institute, to say we have these large populations, in fact, impressively multi-ethnic populations, where we have um, a lot of clinical characterization and a lot of genomic characterization, the latter uh, being more useful. And several large groups, academic and commercial, are interacting in the process of uh, this data stage effort, hosting, and this is a big part of it, uh, the data on uh, the uh, various um, so-called cloud service providers, including Azure and um, Am uh, Amazon Web Services and Google. And what I noticed was that there was only one group that was working uh, with the clinical data in, in, in any degree. And initially, I think it was not that well recognized, but by this time, about a year and a half out, Paul, a year and a half out into data stage? Yeah, a year and a half out into it, people are looking to this use of I2B2 with the picture API to be able to join together the full richness of clinical data with the genomics. Because those of you who've been involved with clinical data know that it is such it's so rich, it's so detailed, but it also changes so fast that even though uh, the, the, the clinically oriented data models, such as OMOP, which I think we should talk more about because it's so valuable, but even those don't move fast enough to actually uh, encapsulate the full richness of clinical um, annotations and how fast they continue to evolve. And so I see uh, those efforts uh, of joining the clinical with the with the genomic and other omic as one of the uh, key areas that uh, I2B2 continues to um, to contribute. Also, because it's been so flexible in, in being able to represent a variety of electronic health record systems, um, and I'm bringing this out only because some of you may not be aware of this. There is this ACT network which you need to uh, learn more about, and it's part of the CTSA effort. And it involves how many, Diane, centers? It's under 60. So under 60. You know, back in the day, I would have been impressed with three. So this is on the order of dozens of academic health centers that allow you, allow you to issue queries across the system. For those of you who are data nerds like I am, I have to ask you and me the question, why aren't you publishing with this data. There are so many questions that are easily answerable, not all of them, but are answerable about rare events or rare um, combinations of events and interesting combinations of events that you can ask of this national, uh, uh, national resource today. Other things that uh, I want to bring up is that um, there is a growing international uh, community. And you can see some of that uh, vibrance in the uh, reports that I got regrettably, because this is my hometown, Geneva, Switzerland, and I was not able to make it, got in reports from the, the Geneva meetings. And I think it's important to recognize a bit why that is. I, open source has in Europe a, a far uh, greater uh, amount of leverage because the Europeans have been burnt many, many times by American-led uh, closed source 
initiatives so that um, uh, they are much more uh, open, I think appropriately, to uh, these open source uh, software implementations uh, with open APIs. And the next uh, topic I'd like to talk, talk about is how do we work together as a community? Though I'm looking at Diane, am I going too long? No, no. Okay, all right. Um, which is, we started understandably as an, although we had an open source license, is Sean here? Not yet. Not yet. Sean was very mindful to basically uh, make sure that the software worked as advertised uh, and that did not break as we in, as we improved it. And then I think that was a very important and necessary phase. I think as we go forward, uh, we've opened up the code base to the community and I think that's going to accelerate, especially under the leadership of this technology committee that uh, Griffin Weber is going to be uh, leading. Some of it will be around the actual I2B2 implementation itself. Some of it, of, of it will be around APIs, such as the picture of API. That I that I noted. I do think that um, we've uh, come a long way in that regard, and I believe that will be the basis for our further reaching out to the community about um, getting them more involved. And that's why I think you'll see more in in the way of contributing members. I do think that we've made a, a tactical error uh, previously that I hope to uh, get some support from you in correcting, which is there are a number of very I2B2 centered events that we have not sufficiently brought in to this community. So for example, there's a, an extensive investment we've made in natural language processing bake-offs. And we've made, we've extracted data from I2B2 systems and I don't know if I'm allowed to even to say too much about it. I heard from Kansas City that there's some amazing data coming uh, our way. Is there anybody from Kansas City here today? Hey, 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 do you know about this? Good. Okay, so I'm not just making it up. Um, and so I think bring it to this event, uh, some of these advances in using natural language processing is front and center where we are with regard to deep phenotyping, where we are with regard to using the textual record as at least being as being at least as important as the um, codified data in understanding patients for the purposes of the many uses we know, but specifically in my mind for um, discovery research. And in that uh, respect unless you actually tell me that it's a bad idea, I will uh, be making more public, but it's up to you. A contest for the, that will come to fruition at the end of 2019 to make an I2B2 data set available to, through the picture API so that we can we will articulate a discovery goal, a genuine one, <clears throat> not a make work one, that will actually require knowledge of the I2B2 uh, picture API, which is available, and we'll make this available with a small prize. What's amazing, by the way, is how effective these contests are worldwide in generating uh, both improvements in the API, as well as increased understanding of, of the opportunities. And so we'll be around all day. If you think this is a terrible idea, uh, let me know, because otherwise it's something that we're, we're going to do and it will actually generate, I think, and the reason why I want your feedback, because you will see, I, every time I've done one of these contests, is international response. And what happens is you in various parts of the world will hear about your users saying, how do we do this? 
you, you know, just recently, speaking of international, yeah. so we just started. Please, Diane, can you just speak in the microphone? No, no, don't, don't, don't go away. I'm not going away. I am not going away. I'm stay, staying right stay next to you. Stay. So, no, I just thought this was really good. So we finally turned on Google Analytics on the, the I2B2 website, um, and we collected, you know, it was like a couple of weeks worth of data. But like when you looked at the map of the world, I mean, obviously there's hotspots in the U.S. and, and in Europe, but um, there are. When we make genomics available, this was back in 2008 when we barely spelled genomics. And what happened, I, was, I got after with so many thank you letters from various teams because we made the data available when a lot of teams around the world did not have access to the kinds of data and genomic data. We made it available. And that's very much the value of the spirit of I2B to make useful data available to a much larger community than a narrow community of researchers that didn't have access to it. And they were thanking me that we jump started the whole work in genomics in significant parts of the world. So we, we will be doing this. And Hang on. Wake up your computer because you turn the mic so off. Something happened. <laughs> I must have touched something. No, I think it just went to sleep, but it turns off the mic for the people online. Okay. Thank you. All right, good. So um, to get a better sense of who you are and so you understand better who you are, how many of you are in IT uh, departments? I would say about a third as opposed to informatics. How many of you are in informatics groups? All right. So there looks to me like some. There's some. It looks to me that it's actually roughly equal, but it's actually these are not uh, complete uh, uh, overlapping subsets. I'd say that there's about a uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, overlap, and those are the large groups. How many of you are non-informatics, non-IT uh, researchers or policy people? And just because I'm, I'm curious, how many of you have I not been able to identify by these large categories? One, two, okay, now you ask for, who are you? Intersystems. So, okay, so Intersystems for those who do, who's not only a sponsor and I wanna thank them, but they're responsible for supporting a language called Cache, AKA Mumps. And here's my trivia uh, quiz for the day. What does the M in mumps stand for? Anybody know? What? Mumps. The first M. First M. Yes, M is for MGH. Um, I was I was with Vinod Kosla um, yet last week, and he was trying to show us. Uh, how much, how, he said, I used to program in, in mumps. And he was trying to say that because he wanted to diss appropriately how backwards some of uh, medical IT was. But uh, I, I could tell he had, he had overreached a little bit. So I said, so what is, what is the, if you program in mumps, mumps in the 1970s, what does the first M stand for? And he did not know that because my point was, of course, that MGH developed uh, that language that is the, with all its warts, the basis, and there are many, the, the basis of the leading electronic health record uh, system vendors around. So, and I point that out only to say that so many of these vendors poo 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 academic uh, efforts in informatics, whereas in fact, mumps uh, led to their existence. And similarly, a lot of I2B2 uh, implementations have succeeded. Whereas I can tell you, since we started this in 2006, I can't tell you uh, how many times, because I've lost count. I've heard about companies that said, don't you mind your pretty heads, we'll show you how this is actually done commercially. And there are big companies whose name you know, who, who said they were gonna do it and they never were able uh, to do it and still have not done it. And so uh, that's, that's why I think it's important to remember that 
although industry is in fact the way in which I2B2 and other such systems get uh, distributed and end up being widely successful. And there's a company, some of which whose uh, leftovers I see here, like recombinant data, which was important in the early uh, years of, uh, of, of I2B2 to make others aware of it and to implement it more widely. It was incredibly important. So I, you know, people like to talk about the uh, academic uh, industrial relationships, but they really want to just get past the past because they don't want to do it. We've actually done it and we've done, we've done it effectively. And we continue to do it effectively. So at this point, I feel like um, I've uh, hit uh, most of the highlights. Uh, how many more minutes? Wow, it's very you very unusual for me to be so short-winded, uh, and 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 I'm wondering whether I should uh, take advantage of it or actually uh, contribute it. To... Yes. Thank you, Diane. Okay. I love uh, questions, and I don't get to meet you almost ever. I am follow this man's lead. Ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I forgot about that. So my name is uh, Isaac Kohane. Most people call me Zach. I'm trained. I went to medical school, um, and nobody in my family had gone to medical school, so I had no idea what medical school was about. And when I ended up uh, in my first year of medical school, I realized, realized, oh my goodness, it's not what I thought it was. I thought it was science, and that's the way we're going to make uh, treatments progress. And I realized, uh, uh oh, it's instead a very noble uh, trade, and that that's not what I what I had thought I'd signed up for. And so I went to do a bit of tizzy. And I was fortunate enough to find a temporary escape hatch. I, I dropped out of medical school temporarily to get a PhD in computer science with uh, my then thesis advisor, now longtime friend and collaborator, Peter Solovich, professor at MIT, founder of the Clinical Decision Making Group. So I did my PhD in artificial intelligence in the heyday, the first heyday of artificial intelligence when this is in the heyday of expert systems where we use human driven knowledge so knowledge as uh, verbally expressed and uh, given up after inter interrogation by experts we encoded that in uh, computing systems as as opposed to ai as done in the 2019 era where it's data driven much more data driven where the data tell us what the patterns are but what the two eras have in common is unreasonable hype. And I can't tell you how many business plans have, are equally uh, optimistic and glowing in 1983 to disappear without a trace, but along with several hundred million dollars in, of, 2000, of, of 1985 money uh, without a trace. And so I'm much more optimistic despite my, my uh, skepticism about this version of AI than I was uh, 30 years ago because uh, we have the data to be uh, data driven. But what happened then um, after my PhD, I returned to medical school and I truly enjoyed it for what I now knew it to be, which is a noble profession. And I appreciated some of the opportunities to do science on the margins, but more than anything else, I, am, I'm, I'm, I enjoyed the ride to becoming a person who would take care of patients for a short while. And so what happened, I did my residency in pediatrics here in Boston, I then did my residency in and my fellowship in pediatric endocrinology, and then I started a research group in medical informatics, the Children's Hospital Informatics Program, which uh, Emmanuel now leads. And we did a lot of things, and what was amazing is it grew organically uh, from me, one person, to uh, about 100 people, including many of you have heard about, in addition to Ken Mandel, my, my former students, <clears throat> is uh, Atul Butte out at UCSF, uh, Dan Nygren, who's CIO at Children's, and <clears throat> the list goes on and on. 
And then what happened, uh, because of I2B2, interestingly, uh, we were, uh, because academia understands big dollars as well, um, we were awarded, once we were awarded the I2B2 grant, we were given a center for biomedical informatics at Harvard Medical School. And four and a half years ago, that became the Department of Biomedical Informatics. And that's the department that I'm very pleased to be the chair of. And I'm a professor of biomedical informatics and pediatrics. And I can tell you, it's a department where we strongly believe that, like everybody else says, but doesn't pay that much attention to, medicine is broken. But we actually believe that it is fixable. And I was, you know, we do believe that uh, industry has an important role, and I host a, um, a, uh, a salon which I invite you to every month at Harvard, an entrepreneur salon where we have a well-known entrepreneur with strong academic roots who tells us how interesting and problematic and error-filled there is a path from academia to business. <coughs> the reason I bring it up is we had Krishna Yeshwant uh, speak to us uh, recently. He's uh, low man on the totem pole in the Harvard hierarchy because he's, I think, an instructor. Uh, but in the rest of the world, he's a big man because he's a managing partner at Google, at Google Ventures. And he was talking about all the problems with the healthcare system. And he shared with us that when he meets with CEOs of healthcare systems, they understand the problems, but they don't feel like they have any room to actually fix it, which is an odd kind of leadership role. And what I'm here to tell you is that part of the impetus behind IP2B2 and the department that I was uh, privileged to found is that we believe that because medicine at its core is an information processing and knowledge processing business, having a good handle on that, on optimizing that, on making it actually work for our doctors and for our patients is actually what's going to transform the, the healthcare system. So I know this sounds very um, Silicon Valley-ish of me, but I really believe that. And uh, that, but I, rather than going to Silicon Valley to start a company, which would have been fun, I decided to stay at Harvard and to be within the belly of the beast to see how can we actually transform healthcare without just putting, uh, demolishing it, putting it aside and starting with something else. So thank you for giving me the uh, luxury of uh, pontificating about myself. Any other questions? Yes. So you mentioned a little bit ago that uh, you were appointed to run into some competition, you were going to have data lists at least to different groups, et cetera, and yep. you wanted to incorporate uh, some genomic data along with medical records. So I was wondering a little bit if you could speak about the difference in uh, data release norms between, say, the genomics community, which has a very strong history of releasing all data, and the medical record community, which um, unfortunately, for privacy reasons, uh, can't actually release a lot of data when it's being published. And, uh, how do you think that can be reconciled as you move forward as a field? Thanks for asking a question. I think it's a question actually worth revisiting every two years. And I don't think I've thought too deeply about it for about two years. So this is about the, this is the rather right time. So genomics data looks and is, in fact, shared more widely than clinical data. Let's just say that up front. But as usual, <clears throat> the grass always looks a little bit greener than this. And so the reason why it, initially there, uh, people would clone genes and it would take a while for the sequence to be shared. But when NCBI started making um, available in GenBank the sequences worldwide, that started a culture of sharing, not only sh of sharing, but of bragging that I shared this many sequences and therefore I must be more of a player if I can share uh, the, the, this, many, this many sequences. Uh, <clears throat> to NHGRI's uh, credit, they started demanding this as part of the grant mechanisms that they actually share uh, those data. Now, in truth, um, it's, not, it's still not as transparent as you'd like. You know, I think the gold standard of sharing has been uh, the UK Biobank, where essentially anybody in the world can, with a few hundred dollars can get access to all the genomic data and all the clinical data, period. 
there are several data, uh, uh, genomic data sets throughout this country that still today, <coughs> funded by NIH, you'll have a hard time getting hold of, especially <coughs> as linked to the clinical data. They might talk about um, their concerns about uh, privacy, but those are actually just um, excuses. The real uh, problem is they want to be able to publish on it first and maximally before they fully um, let go of it. As we actually articul uh, unpacked in this New England Journal data summit that we had, where we had the trialists and the uh, what we were called uh, data parasites. Um, there's a tension because on the one hand, the trialists feel that they have uh, labored for years to make that data happen, and it is in fact effortful. And on the other hand are the data scientists and the patients are saying, we already paid you for this. We want to accelerate science, make it available. So that's a tension that happens even within genomics. Within clinical data, we do have a genuine problem of identifiability. Almost any uh, significant, um, almost, uh, that's an interesting uh, editorial comment about data sharing. Uh, in fact, uh, sorry, that reminds me, that, that's a, that was perfect to uh, trigger the tangent. Reminds me, I was at uh, IBM Yorktown Heights maybe five years ago, and they were telling me, Kohane, what, what's with all this uh, data hugging that hospital systems do? Why can't they release the data? And I said, you know, that's an interesting question, but it's a general property of the human condition because certainly hospitals share, uh, don't want to share data for privacy reasons, but also for competitive reasons. It's their data, their patients. Leaking, you know, leaking data can, be, can also allow to leak patients, but you know, it's even true of uh, patient uh, advocacy groups. I've seen three different breast cancer groups not want to share data because they thought they were the, they were the righteous uh, source of all an analysis. And I said, and you know, IBM, I even heard that there's these big data companies like IBM that don't want to share their, their data. So I think it's part of it is cultural and part of it is a real issue around privacy. I'm most impressed by some efforts like led by Nigam Shah out of Stanford, where they um, released the correlations across the electronic health record. And that those correlations turned out to be incredibly valuable, even though they really are non-disclosing to a deep degree. And um, Andrew Beam, one of my colleagues now at the School of Public Health, uh, just released uh, embeddings, uh, which are these uh, probabilistic vectors that describe the relationship between concepts and context, and embeddings that included electronic health record and a major commercial insurer and a lot of the text of the world all in one form. So there's actually machine learning formats that are, allow us to share a lot of the correlational structure that's important for research without actually uh, disclosing patient data. Now I think it's time for me to move on. Thank you for your two questions. So, and we did a lot of things and what was amazing is it grew organically uh, from me, one person, to uh, about 100 people, including many that you've heard about, and so in addition to Ken Mandel, my, my former students, <clears throat> is uh, Atul Butte out at UCSF, uh, Dan Nygren, who's CIO at Children's, and <clears throat> the list goes on and on. And then what happened, uh, because of I2B2, interestingly, uh, we were, uh, because academia understands big dollars as well, um, we were awarded once we were awarded the I2B2 grant, we were given a center for biomedical informatics at Harvard Medical School. And four and a half years ago, that became the Department of Biomedical Informatics. And that's the department that I'm very pleased to be the chair of. And I'm a professor of biomedical informatics and pediatrics. And I can tell you it's a department where we strongly believe that like everybody else says, that doesn't pay that much attention to, medicine is broken. 
but we actually believe that it is fixable. And I was, you know, we do believe that uh, industry has an important role, and I host a um, a um, a salon, which I invite you to every month at Harvard, an entrepreneur salon, where we have a well-known entrepreneur with strong academic roots who tells us how interesting and problematic and error-filled there is a path from academia to business. The reason I bring it up is we had Krishna Yeshwant uh, speak to us uh, recently. He's a low man on the totem pole in the Harvard hierarchy because he's, I think, an instructor. Uh, but in the rest of the world, he's a big man because he's a managing partner at Google, at Google Ventures. And he was talking about all the problems of the healthcare system. And he shared with us that when he meets with CEOs of healthcare systems, they understand the problems, but they don't feel like they have any room to actually fix it, which is this odd kind of leadership role. And what I'm here to tell you is that part of the impetus behind IP2B2 and the department that I was uh, privileged to found is that we believe that because medicine at its core is an information processing and knowledge processing business, having a good handle on that, on optimizing that, on making it actually work for our doctors and for our patients is actually what's going to transform the, the healthcare system. So I know that this sounds very um, Silicon Valley-ish of me, but I really believe that. And uh, that, but I, rather than going to Silicon Valley to start a company, which would have been fun, I decided to stay at Harvard and to be within the belly of the beast to see how can we actually transform healthcare without just putting, uh, demolishing it, putting it aside and starting with something else. So thank you for giving me the uh, luxury of uh, pontificating about myself. Any other questions?